Uh, so last time you're going over the properties of uh, uh, canonical full rank canonical exponential family. And um, the first thing that we discussed was um, uh, this uh, result um, that A is a convex function uh, and the domain of A is a convex set. And uh, so Again, A, we think of it as RD to R union infinity as um, is the convention in convex analysis. And then the domain of such a function is uh, where it is finite. And so this is in our setting the same as this um, natural parameter state. And so A is convex uh, and the domain is the convex function and, and, and the domain is a convex set. Um, the second one was this differential equal or like the identity that's saying uh, that uh, the um, basically derivatives of A are uh, the moments of T, the sufficient statistics. So, uh, we went over this uh, rather quickly. I'm just going to maybe go over it again. So um, what, what this is sort of formally saying is the interior in the interior parameter space or in the interior of the domain of A, uh, basically A is C infinity, which means that it's infinitely differentiable of our order and the, the derivatives are continuous. So it's a very smooth function. And moreover, these derivatives give you information about the moments. Um, the first derivative, uh, which uh, it's a multivariate function, so the first derivative, you can think of the like identifier with the gradient. So the gradient is the expectation of t. Uh, and the second derivative, you can identify with this Hessian matrix. Um, that Hessian matrix gives you the covariance matrix of t. Okay. Uh, you can imagine the higher order moments give you higher order. The higher order derivatives give you higher order information about the moments. Um, so the proof is via um, the properties of moment gelling functions. So the main idea is that in the exponential family, we can uh, calculate the um, MGF rather easily. So uh, if you recall, this is my general formula. Uh, for the density of the canonical family. And then uh, let's say this is with respect to some underlying measure I'm, I'm writing as nu tilde uh, or d nu tilde if you want, x. So, uh, or respect to nu tilde. If you want. Um, and so if you recall, uh, a theta, is there to normalize this density, right? So to make it a probability density. So we can integrate both sides. Um, the integral would be, has to be one. So integrate against uh, this measure. This side has to be one. And so this um, gives me some, this e to the a theta comes out, integral e to the theta, dx, right? And then I can rearrange, uh, multiply both sides by ea theta. You can see that ea theta is really this integral. Okay, and then you can take the log if you want. Uh, but that's uh, how a theta is determined in a sense. And um, it's useful because when I now compute the MGF, right, moment jank function of x, um, or t, basically t of x. So this is, um, it's a by definition expectation of expect e to the inner product of u and t, let's say t of x if you want. Uh, and so I need to calculate this expectation. I can take the integral 
approach so I can approach like uh, integrate uh, this against the density of x so it's this is as a whole as a, as a function of x so I can integrate it against the density and so this is giving me the expectation okay so far so good This whole thing is a function of the random variable, and we want the density of the random variable. So um, this is like some some g of x, right? And so we are calculating the quotation of g of x. Um, questions? Uh, and then I plug in e to the theta t of x minus a theta, right? And some simplification happens here. Right, I can again pull out e to the a theta or negative a theta. And then expectation u plus theta can combine uh, these terms. And then d nu tilde of x. Sounds good. So then what happens then here? So do we know? Yes, so this would be E of A U plus theta because of this general identity we have. Um, and this would be true um, if <clears throat> u plus theta is in the domain, is in the domain of A, or rather in, in omega naught, okay, because otherwise this would be infinity. So, if, um, so to be a little more precise, we start from theta, which is in the domain, uh, but this is not enough. I'm going to start from uh, theta, which is in the interior of the domain. Okay. And then uh, make sure that theta plus u is also in the, now I can assume it in the domain, but is in the interior of the domain. Okay, I can say, is in omega naught, okay? Uh, if, if u is small enough, this is gonna happen because of the definition of the uh, interior. So there exists, let's say some epsilon bigger than zero, such that if the norm of u is less than or equal to epsilon, then, um, so let's say this one uh, implies two, uh, or, or let's say one and two. There exists an epsilon such that if this holds, then uh, theta plus u is is going to be an omega naught. Okay, so uh, this is omega naught. I'm not at the boundary, so I'm inside. So I can put a ball of a certain radius, small enough, such that everything in that neighborhood, so this is theta, um, and, and u is like, let's say any vector whose length is less than, so yes. And we're able to say this because uh, if omega not in this context. No, because I am, um, and specifically, they said it's the interior. Oh, because it's in the interior, it's all small enough such that it's using that. Basically, you're using the fact that uh, the interior is not empty. So, or or basically, this result holds for the interior. Oh, we got that. And um, Yeah, convexity is good, but even if you're at the boundary, and like I said, you still have some problems. Not all directions would work necessarily. Um, so, set theta plus u, so I'm going to assume that u is small enough. So, I really need to engineer in the neighborhood of zero because once I have it in the neighborhood of zero, then I can differentiate it and evaluate it at zero. That would give me all the information. So, we don't need u to be large. Make it small enough. So, the fixed theta, make u small enough. Uh, that, that epsilon, 
take as epsilon as small enough, then for every u, this is gonna u plus theta would be in the interior. So this is now that it's gonna hold. And so it's gonna be finite, this thing. So e to the a u or theta plus u. And then I put the other one here. Uh, so that's basically a compact form for the MGF. Um, so the log of the MGF is called Kamiyalan generating function, and the log is even simpler. So just as a note, log of MTU, this gives me a theta plus u, right, minus a theta. It's for this reason, A is called Kamiyalan generating function because the function is the other shape it's generating the it's the Kamiyalan generating, generating function. Kamiyalan. Um, so these Kamiyalans are interesting. They're Similar to moments. They're not moments. They're similar to central moments. They're not central moments either. It gives you a different description of the distribution. Okay. Uh, the first cumulant. What is the first cumulant? The second cumulant is the variance. The first is that the expectation. I actually forgot what the first cumulant is. Uh, um, So let's do it for a univariate random variable. So let's say m of z is expectation of, right? Um, if I have log mzt, I'm gonna get a log of this. So the derivative would be mzt divided prime divided by mzt, right? They really were the log. So, and then evaluated at zero, it would be actually m prime z t evaluated at zero uh, because m of z at, at, at zero is one. Okay, so uh, you're right. It's gonna be the first moment uh, because we'll see the, the first, the, the first derivative of the mgf at divided at zero gives you the mean. So for the mean, they're the same, but it gets more complicated. So just a side note. Okay, so this procedure we're gonna do. So instead of the log, I'm gonna work with the, the original one. So if I differentiate, uh, let's say with respect to ui, this mt of u, uh, that would give me, what does it give me if I differentiate the expectation? Expression. Expression um, yeah, it's exponential. So you get the derivative of the exponent times the, sorry, times itself. So it's like going to be derivative of the exponent, this term doesn't depend on theta. So the first one would gives me like just differenti differentiate like this guy, right? With respect to u and then times e to the, the same kind of exponent, right? So if I evaluate this at zero, u equals zero, what do I get? So this part goes away, right? I get zero here, I get a theta minus a theta would be just zero, and then I get one. So that would go away. So I get partial derivative of this evaluated at u equals zero, right? Um, which you can view as basically the, the i derivative of a evaluated at theta, right? So I'm going to just write it as gradient of A, uh, evaluate theta the i coordinate. So that's what it is. Right. 
Do the same thing. Variable to respect to the i coordinate of this, and then evaluate the data. Does that make sense? That really makes sense. Okay. So this is good. But what is that derivative? This is the general idea. So this at this point is general. So that's one way of calculating for this particular uh, distribution, but this is general. So if you have that the NGF is finite in a neighborhood of zero, then um, this thing, which is just by definition, uh, we'll look at the theta if you want, e to the, doesn't matter because we differentiate with respect to u. Uh, the thing is that I can I can move the derivative inside. So this is going to be equal to, so I'm not proving this, but this is the general result that if the MGF is finite in a neighborhood of zero, then this operation is valid. So I can move the derivative if I put it inside. And now when I differentiate this, um, what do I get here? Uh, so this is like summation u i t i x, right? One of the one of the terms will be as like let's write it like this: so sigma j from one to d u j t j x. Right. I'm differentiating respect to the u i. So u two for example. This is like u1 t1x plus u2 t2x plus u3 t. So what happens when I differentiate? So you get tix, and then the rest is just the e to the whatever that is. And the expectation. Now I evaluate everything at zero. U equals zero, U equals zero, U equals zero. So what happens here is this side is gonna be, this is gonna be one, so you get expectation of Ti. So this is the general property that the derivatives of the MGF would give you the moments, the first moments, okay? So this is one expression you have, this is another expression, so these are equal we can see that the i coordinate of the gradient is just the expectation. So this, this part you can generally argue once it's, um, uh, finite being in a with zero, then this operation is valid. So this identity of the, the derivatives of the energy have to give you the moments. And in this case, we calculated it turns out to be the gradient of it, yes. Could you explain then how uh, you were able to use that differential operator into the expectation? Yeah, so that's that's the part that I'm um, sort of relying on, like a general fact, which I'm not proving. So if a is going to be finite in the neighborhood of zero, so that's the part that we argue. So if the u is small enough, so if the u is small enough, it's finite. Once this happens, then you can use down the converters here. So this is a more technical result that you can use down the converters here to identify that. Um, and then how you can use it is a little bit beyond the scope of it. But if you take that and then you get a problem for us, um, you can, um, once you break, or then, then it's doable. So you can show that you can uh, interchanging your limits. So imagine differentiation with your limits. So you want to, like, this is saying limits of a bunch of expectations and expectation of a limit. And these results are like convergence here as a problem. How many convergence, what is the convergence? The thing is, what happens if a sequence of functions is converging? Uh, is the expectation conversion to the expectation of the limit? And so BCD is a power, powerful like kind of 
result that it allows me to argue that then this is going to be the name of the same the principle of all order and you can compare sales that you can see is anything. The general idea is that this is going to show first that it's finite for all the neighborhood. Then we can do it. Oh, and you find it you would not that's that's not what it's not finding. So find it is fine, but it isn't fine in the This is small enough, this is fine. The U is always gonna be fine. So you being small, um means that I'm looking at this function in the root of zero. So this at zero is always fine. Because zero and MGF would be just always it's always one. And zero plug it this rotational one is so an MGF is always one at zero. But in some cases, if you move like epsilon of A, this is gonna be so the random variable is to heavy tail. Okay, so this is again for a different course, but um for example, if this is finite, it means that all the moments are finite. Okay, so you, you have the Taylor expansion. Uh, if, for example, you have this dilution whose moments at some point fail to exist, like an infinite, then this can't happen. So it can't be that it's finite to the neighbor. So it, it depends on K being a random variable. Okay, a, a random variable whose moment MGF is finite in the neighbor of zero. Uh, the tails of the distribution are decaying fast enough for it to, to happen. Um, so it's either going to be that or, or no. So it's either finite in the neighborhood of zero, if I'm not wrong. If it's finite away from zero, it's going to be finite in the neighborhood of zero. So these are all technical details, which if you're interested, you could talk to me later. We can go over it. But um, this is good enough. If it's finite in the neighborhood of zero, okay. So for all you which are sufficiently small in this sense, okay, this is finite and this is good. And this is true if it's finite at a certain point outside zero. Uh, but that's that's more technical, I believe that's true. But this part of the is true. Okay. How do you know How do you know what? So how do we know this? It's not going to be fine. You know it's fine if we're moving sufficiently small. How do we know this? No, no, no. It, what I said is like, it's one. This is one at zero. But it may or may not be finite if you move away from zero. You don't know that. It's linked to the existence of moments. It's not obvious. But in this particular case, what I'm trying to say there is an epsilon such that you would normally be less than epsilon to scale it by this we know what interior physics, right? Theta is in the interior. If theta is interior in the interior, it means that I can choose u smaller such that theta plus u is in the domain. Theta is in the existence in the domain, this is taking all of these fine. The thing that goes fine and is fine is also here. So this is the end here. So the end is the same. Okay. And curious explain why this is the rule Uh which part? I think that the eight yeah. The order is equal to uh B for that. Right. This is the different This part. That's the definition of A. The A is really this, the E to the A is really this interesting. The third is like that, let's see. This and here is the E to the A. Sounds good. How do we? 
Uh, so it, it's a function that takes a vector producing a number, the multiply. Uh, but interpretation is fine. So what I'm trying to say is partial moments. So the first moments, like differentiated ones with respect to one of the coordinates, the value of zero is the expectation of the i. So this is a vector. We're talking about the MGF of a vector. Random, right? A random vector, right? So partial derivatives are the expectations of the coordinates. Second order partial derivatives are the, what? the other things, like the expectation of other things, like T i, T j, for example, expectation of the interactions, and then. The moments are complicated. Moments are random variables. So imagine if I have a random vector. So what are the moments of this? Let's call it Z to be that confused, or T. I have a random vector T. So the moments are going to be things like t1 alpha, t2 beta, or alpha 1, alpha 2, 2 t d alpha, uh, b. So for any alpha 1, alpha 2. So this information is in the MGF. We differentiate with respect to different like coordinates. The alpha times with respect to the first coordinate, alpha, the alpha two times with respect to the second coordinate, and then things like this happen. Okay. These things come out. If we can uh, part of the and evaluate that. Okay. Yes. Yes. If you do it twice, you get uh what do we get? So if I differentiate respect to now U J, um I can move it inside. So partial derivative U J, move it inside at this point. Tj comes out. Okay. Yes. And then evaluate zero. Right. Yeah, the second derivative is a little bit tricky, but I'll let you figure it out. Uh, so what happens is it has to come out to be the covariance. So not the second mode in this case. Uh, so take the der derivatives of both sides and set it equal to zero. It should come out to be the covariance of the i times j coordinate. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit tricky because this is not exactly uh, the moments, but if you do it, I think with the so the problem is this. If you do it on this, uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated. If you take the log, the log, so that's why I said the common are easy. So the second common in the unitary case is the variance. Um, I believe this, if you do it, then this is just the variance. If you do it at this level, it's going to be a little bit tricky because you get more terms. Uh, so you can see it here, if you do this on, on P would be the P I P J. That's not the covariance. That's the second one. But the first one is also not exactly clean. So once you clean up using the first order moments, then you should get the covariance. So do do it as an exercise for the second one. It's a good um, um, exercise, I would say. Yes. We get some Yes, so it should get the same result. Uh, this is the key to differentiate. But then you have to argue that the second moments are 
So this so this part has the other one. Uh, now you have it, it's gonna be still the same level of complexity, but the question is that um it it's gonna be complex, but if you do it, you prove a more general one. So the second the dimensional is not there, so you're gonna be providing the system Whereas if you do this, uh, and this is the yeah, I mean, I would say do it both ways, and you see it's the same complexity, but this one is to, to, to provide a more general result. Well. That the uh, derivatives of the coming of general function, the second order derivatives give you the providing. The end result is the same, I guess the computation is the same. Um, okay. Any questions? So if you don't get back then and in the details uh, at the high level, the first derivative is higher order derivatives are connected to higher order moments. Okay, that's it. And this happens in the interior of all the virtual and canonical time. Good differential identity. In particular, A is an interesting map. It's convex, it's differentiable, uh, very smooth, okay, uh, in the interior of the map. Uh, what else? Okay, one of the uh, interesting consequence is that because this Hessian is equal to the covariance matrix and the covariance matrix is positive semi-definite, the Hessian is positive semi-definite. Okay. Is there a conclusion? If you don't look at the second bullet point here, perhaps. Uh, what functions have the Hessian, which is positive semi-definite? Convex functions. Yeah, convex functions are uh, the only function. If, if the function is differentiable of the border, I mean, then the convexity is the of the Hessian being not positive semi-definite. Um, it's going to be strictly positive definite um, if the covariance is strictly positive definite. Okay. Uh, and so you can connect strict convexity of A to a statistical fact. Fact being the covariance is strictly positive definite. Um, and I believe that's one of your homework is you have to figure out what that means. Covariance being not strictly positive definite is problematic. The singular covariance is problematic. Like the general multivariate distributions that you look at, um, they're non singular. So if the covariance matrix is not strictly positive definite, it means that there's some zero eigenvalues, there's some directions. Like it has a like non trivial normal it's not invertible. And so the distribution is sort of singular. We talked a little bit about that, like singular Gaussian distribution. So if the distribution is not singular, it's going to be strictly positive because the covariance is going to be strictly positive and so it's going to be strictly convex. So they just, like beyond expect the pathological case, this is going to happen, yes. Uh, is that how we Rank deficiency. Uh, if we're I'm not sure. If we're like in these different states, or mm -hmm. right, right, right. It's exactly the dependent. Yeah. So good. Uh, is this following? Maybe, maybe it's a homework. Thing. So it's related to this idea. Yes. So if yeah, perhaps in the full rank family, that that could happen. That's a good point. So that's the homework. So you have to get. So if this happens. Then the covariance matrix of TRX is going to be uh, singular that you can argue. And then here is different origin. So the covariance matrix of TRX is singular if and only you can find the direction in such that this one. Um, that I think is true. So it's related to this E2. So if E2, I leave the E2 is true, then that can't happen. But perhaps you should check your homework problems uh, to be sure.
Uh, okay, good. Uh, okay. Any other questions? So you can see the nice interplay between statistics and analysis. So differentiation is in statistics, like not statistical, like analysis, the calculus, and then covariance is statistical and then the type. The quantum values sort of have this interesting interplay of analysis and statistical probabilistic the facts. Um, so here's an example that we looked at before. So the Gaussian single variable, or let's say univariate Gaussian with mean theta variance one. This is the density in canonical form, for example. Uh, you can take this to the edge of x if you want. Um, um, so if you do that, then uh, a theta is this, right? And if I differentiate it once, I get theta. If I differentiate twice, I get one, and sort of agrees with theory. The mean is theta, variance is one. Uh, quite impressive. So we didn't know, like we didn't have to do an integral or anything, just differentiate the mean and the variance come out. Okay. And this is a good way of like recovering moments of exponential family. So if you have, you know a lot of examples now, or well, you, you'll know from the homework exam. So for example, Python is an example. And and then if you believe it's a communal generating function, the derivatives are going to generate the communals. For example, in this case, all the other communals are zero. So the Gaussian first and second are non zero, and then the rest are going to be zero. For the Poisson, you change the value, and all the communals turn out to be the same, I believe. So the mean is the same as the variance, the same as the third order, and that's the consequence of what the one generating function of the Poisson is. So you can learn a lot about these exponential family distributions by by looking at theta and taking derivatives. Okay. We didn't, we didn't talk about that the high order derivatives are what, what they mean, but if you believe it's a common thing, then you can think that it's a common thing, higher or common, higher or common, and CR is zero. Um, okay. So, good. Yeah. Yes. Why do I think they always be there? Uh, right. Because that's the definition of a theta. So it's like a normalizing constant. Normalizing constant. Like e to the a theta is a normalizing constant. So it normalizes the density. It's a function that takes a d-dimensional variable theta and maps it to a number. And e to the negative of that number normalizes this series. That's what it is. Just a normalizing cost. Yes. That's full rank canonical, yes. Canonical and full rank in the interior of the domain. So all the other conditions implicit. For most reasonable exponents of that. I didn't say you didn't. I, I'm not sure if I'm used. I have used it. I said if it's full rank, then this is going to be positive, definitely. Uh, whether this result holds, um, you if I drop this, is it going to hold? Uh, most likely it's going to hold, but I'm a little reluctant to say it because maybe there's some minor thing that we did. So um, I'm not even assuming. So it should be in the interior of the domain. So if it's like one of the regularities is the interior of the domain is non empty. If it's empty, there's nothing to prove. 
right? Because this is all called in the interior. If the interior is empty, then it's false. So this, you need that E1 condition. Whether you need E2, it's a good point. I'm not sure. But if this might fall more generally, uh, but under E2, definitely it falls. And under E2, it seems that this is the positive. Okay. Wait, you what? Omega zero is? Omega zero. It's not omega. Like uh, omega zero means you sort that A omega zero out of omega. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by omega. So there is there is this natural parameter space. Yeah, that's omega. Right. That's that's what so all my all the math. I understand the concept that A um, there's no real, let's say the thing is, um, what can we say? So there, let's say the, the parameter space is what you, like, um, so let's say this omega naught is a sum of our R, you can, you can think of R in this, that's, that's all that matters. So we can like, imagine, for example, I can start, um, We have the canonical family. Uh, yeah, okay. So, for example, we can start a canonical family like this. So we set x and x squared, and we have theta 1 and theta 0, theta 1 and theta 2. We can imagine for yourself that some parameters that you think I can consider. I like theta 1 and theta 2 to be the set. That's what you mean by all this. Then it turns out that whatever you like is not going to hold the same. There is something that's like implied by those things normalized, and that will be called omega not, and that's what we have one. Okay, so there's no real, and there's nothing more uh, interesting than this. It's this, and then it's like under larger space, which is R. So there's no omega. Okay. Oh, omega. You don't like this only that. So the setting that I had originally was we start from some omega, you build some parameterization. Um, this is like useless than uh, So start from the general path, let's say, uh, x, and the general parameter says this is like something that you said. You define these a pairs, and then this board says, the subset of this to be valid parameters. At this point, that's what we think of. There's no real moment in this. You can think of this as R D, for example, in general. So we start with R D. Then it forces us to limit ourselves to the subset of R D. Okay. And that's often happens that if that's what your question is, then um, so there's no omega. So don't worry about omega. There's no omega. In the canon subject, there's RD in the zone that there's nothing in between. Every grand house is the same thing. Sounds good. It could be that omega hat is not open. It could have a boundary. And there's an example in your homework problem that you show that there is like a like a it could be that omega not maybe it goes to uh, sometimes it's open, sometimes it's closed. Um, but in most cases, it has an non empty interior, and in the interior, good things happen. Okay. Any other questions? So, this was easy stuff. Now is the hardest stuff. Okay, so far it was easy. And the hardest stuff, I'm just going to just go over like at a high level. This is like a deep result, like fairly deep. Um, it's very interesting and it like ties to a lot of analysis, but we don't want to like spend like teaching analysis in this course. So I'm just going to give you the statistical idea. Hopefully the statistical idea is easy, but trying to show it, uh, I've attempted to show it, but it takes a lot of time. So let's not show it. So the, the main idea is um, this, this canonical parameterization. Is not the only parameterization that should work. 
There is another prioritization, which is statistically meaningful, that's very interesting, uh, that we can reprioritize in terms of that. And you have already seen, like, basically, uh, almost the other course. So the alpha prioritization is called the mean prioritization, it's just the mean of the period. Okay, so if you start, for example, from, uh, uh, like, a canonical family, uh, there is a prioritization to take that, and there's a mean prioritization to the expectation of this. In this case, the expectation is the same thing. So this canonical prioritization and the mean prioritization is the same. In general, they may not be. So um, there's a mean prioritization which is defined by theta. And so if I give you theta, you can give me back this. The whole point of the, like, what we discussed is that this is invertible. So I can go back and forth between theta and mu. And this prioritization is more natural because um, I can estimate these means by averaging. Okay, so if I see I have examples from this model, uh, then it's empirical average with estimate of this. So if I said that I can estimate this by empirical average, so this is a simple uh, estimate similar of mu. Uh, if I want to get an estimate of theta, I have to invert this math mu inverse by two bits. I get good mu estimate of theta. If you recall what I talked about in terms of the MLE, the MLE is exactly this. So the MLE would be setting this equal to that and solve for two. Okay. I don't know if we did the MLE somewhere. I believe we did the MLE. Okay. Uh, did we do MLE? I think we did. Uh, oh, this was the complete mess. I had the, yes, okay. So that's where, uh, Yeah, somewhere I, I I remember we did the MLE. Do you guys remember we did the MLE? Right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the problem we did it last time. I think we did it last time on the board. So it's not here. And it's not. <laughs> it was on the board. But um, so you do that if you have a sequence of I am an example, then you might have a joint. The joint is going to be from the family. You could take the derivative. Uh, it ends up being uh, you're solving for. Um, um, you end up solving gradient F. I'll, I'll do it later. Let's let's do it later. So the MLE would would be um, would be hard. So the MLE of this parameter is hard. So the mean parameter is exactly. And so you want to see if you can go back and forth between the parameterization and what is. Uh, the nature of this mean prioritization. Okay. Is this so far clear? So you can reparameterize in terms of this mean priority instead of working with the, the, the canonical priority. And the mean parameters are more statistically motivated because you see T of X, you can estimate the T of mean of T of X. Not statistically motivated, but it's statistically easier to work with. Sounds good? Okay. Uh, we know. The, this this way of like the one way of going from so this we know this is great so this mean parameter is using the math okay so maybe the mean parameter potentially there is an inverse math so if I can invert this math then everything would be good and there's a result that says in four vector scholarship family this math is invertible in the interior of the domain. So there is a bijection that can go back and forth between the two. Okay. Um, there's a little more to that, but so far so good. So this is canonical two parameters on the Gaussian family. Um, theta one would be anything we can get into the best of zero, but comparing with the Gaussian formula, we see that theta one is. And the light of is where I think it would be one over negative one over two six. So, okay. So the mean parameters here are the T of X is um, 
uh, x and x squared. So the expectation of t of x is really the expectation of x, expectation of x squared, right, under theta if you want. Um, and so this is the mean parameter vector. And so this is this is the mean parameter. Uh, and you can calculate it, it would be like M. Uh, so this is a Gaussian. This is a Gaussian with mean uh, mu varying sigma squared. Uh, so the second problem would be m squared plus sigma squared, right? And I can write m and sigma squared in terms of theta, so you can see this is the map, the map that maps. Uh, theta to mu. Okay, so this is mu theta. Mu theta. And it turns out to be also the gradient of this. Okay, so this, this all works out. Okay. The idea is that this map is invertible. But so far, so good. This, this is doable. Okay. This map is, I can map theta to mu. So this mu parameter can be used that instead of theta. Uh, if you believe there's an inverse. Uh, so far, so good. This is the hard, this is not the hard part. Okay. This is the easy part. So the hard part is this, which is, um, which is saying that um, there is a set. So one thing that I can ask is, um, so as I write theta, in the, the domain of the exponential family, this trace is the subset of R. Okay, these are all possible mean vectors that I can achieve. Okay, and this set is constraint. It can be, for example, in the case of um, the Gaussian, you can see that the mean is the mean vector, or the mean parameter, the first coordinate is the mean, the second coordinate is uh, the second moment, and these are tied because they're coming from the, the same distribution, they can't be anything you want. So for example, this can be negative, but you know more. You know more because, for example, sigma squared has to be positive, right? Because sigma squared has to be non-negative, I know that um, mu two minus mu one squared has to be non-negative. So there's a constraint that they have to satisfy because they're from the same distribution. So they're arising as moments of a single random variable. This thing is called the whole. This is saying the variance is positive. Okay. So there's a constraint that you can relate to the entire satisfied. And in this case, this is the only condition that you need. So, subject to this condition, all other possible mu1, mu2 pairs you can achieve. Okay, I, I need this. And um, if I plot, um, so my theta one and theta two, if you look at, okay, the other way around. So this is my original or canonical parameter space. Uh, and in the canonical parameter space, uh, there is this um, uh, set, which is just the negative reals, basically. Anything that, uh, the other way around, sorry. Uh, so theta one can be anything, theta two has to be negative. So there is this, this is the omega. Um, this is omega naught, okay. Um, the, um, so maybe do it downstairs. So cut, and then, here. Uh, okay, so um, this is the omega naught, and this is mapped by gradient of A to the mean parameter space, which is 
It is a set of possible mean values. And this set is, uh, is, is characterized by this inequality. Uh, at least it has to satisfy this. Uh, so I need to have, let's see, there's this, this thing, uh, parabola. Um, and then anything above this is achievable. Uh, we don't know this, but at least it has to be above this, maybe below. So far, we know that mu1 and mu2 has to satisfy this constraint, OK? Uh, so um, so the main question that one can ask is that, is, is everything here single? Because we know that if you give me a mean, uh, and if you give me a variance, I can find a solution that that means the variance. Okay, there is one solution that can, can do that. Uh, it's like, this is not something obvious. This might be obvious to you now, but let's say if I give you a number mu one, which is um, uh, one and a sigma squared, which is like 3.5, is there a distribution that has this mean and this variance? Is there something or not? So, why? Okay, because a normal distribution can can do this, uh, but why a normal? Why there is a normal distribution for every every sigma squared? Because this there is. <laughs> this is the content of this theorem that I want to say. Like, this is this, that's why I'm saying e. But in, in what it's showing is that it's going to say that for any basically realizable mean parameter, there is an exponential family that achieves that mean. So that the, the, the exponential family that realizes the mean is Gaussian. So that, that's the exponential family that achieves. For every possible realizable mean parameters, you can find an exponential family that achieves those sets. And so it's like one when we prove that, or that we can try to prove is that. There is a suggestion for every pair of the level of depth of the result. Okay. So you may not have thought about whether there exists, but you could um, basically once you write this down, you integrate, you see that okay, I just need this to be not needed and this to be positive, and this is related to the mean and the variance, and I can invert this. Okay, so if you give me any tail on the computer, then, sorry, if you give me a sigma square and then square, if I can invert this map, right? If I give me an n and sigma square, uh, if I can invert this map, I can find theta one and theta two, and I'm going to theta one and theta two and then you get the right? Uh, oh, it's like too, it's too, like you're too familiar with this result to see the significance of it, that there exists a Gaussian with any mean and variance that you give me. This is not necessarily have to be true. It could be some constraint that, so the, the result that I want to talk about is something like this, okay? That, um, let's say they, they satisfy this condition. Um, and um, you know that this has to be true, and this is the only condition you need to satisfy. Uh, then there exists a Gaussian and exponential family that, that can realize any point. Okay. The exponential family that can realize this Gaussian in this case, but in general, um, uh, for any set of like, realizable means that is Gaussian, so there is an exponential family that is used. Um, every point in that in that in that set. So if I want to be a little bit more careful, uh, I have to define what what I mean. So the set of realizable means is this. So the set of all means that I can get. Uh, as the expectation of this TLS uh, under some density, okay? um, not necessarily exponential. So we have this underlying mu, or mu, let's say this is uh, the regulator. What I'm saying is that look at all possible means uh, such that uh, this is just the integral, right? T of x, Tx dx. So if there is a density, not necessarily a function family, such that when I integrate this TLS against that, give me that mu, that mu is realized. Okay. So, for example, if x uh, 
p of x is x1 and, uh, sorry, x and x squared. Uh, this mu is going to be integral x p x dx. Let's say this is this is uh, the leg measure. Um, this will be x squared p x dx. Um, and so, uh, we can argue that for any, uh, uh, I can I can give me give me any mu and any uh, basically non negative. Uh, so if you give me anything, uh, so if this is mu one and mu two, um, as long as they satisfy this inequality, so they have to satisfy this. Um, as long as they satisfy these, there, there is, there's going to be some density that can, can do this. This is not tricky. Uh, this is the only concept, like the only requirement here. Or actually, it's maybe tricky, maybe not. But um, this part is not difficult. So with any new one and new two that you have, new two squared is the same. Mu two is bigger than or equal to mu one. This is saying that the variance is not negative. Okay, this constraint on mu two is saying that the variance is not negative. Uh, and instead of mu one and mu two, let's say not including the boundary. Uh, so let's say if I have the interior of this basically. So this this if if this holds, which means that the variance is positive, um, there is some density that that, that can realize those things. Okay. So the set of all possible mean values that I get for a particular space fixed this is the listing. The set of all means uh, mean, means that I can uh, realize by some density is what I call it. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So is this does it get trickier when we have like three means, four means? Uh, it is trickier, but um, they, they they have to satisfy more constraints. But um, the way that I'm going to define, I, I, I don't care about this particular set. Okay, uh, it, it becomes trickier to define exactly, like those form what are the constraints. But the way I'm defining it is all the constraints that need to be true uh, for it for, for there to be to exist some density such that this holds. Okay, so this is like an abstract definition. I'm going to define this set to be the set of all means that can be realized as uh, like the moments of PLAs for some density of okay. means. But abstractly, there's no issue here. Okay, this is just a well defined set. I might not have to like write it as inequalities or so, but but it's a well defined set. So the the, the interesting thing is everything is in the interior of the set. Can be realized by the exponential family of this. This is the, the full result. Okay. All the means that are cost, like all, all every mean, every mean uh, that's reliable, but some distribution can be realized by the exponential family with that sufficient statistic. Okay. We don't have to go outside the exponential family to realize even that. Okay. It means like it's sort of complete this result. So it's complete that you can sort of capture every moment. By an exponential path. So, for example, if you have this, um, there are many like distributions that they can be like like new one and new two, but the exponential family associated with this can also be the new one and new two. That is the like one more step is that uh, not only Everything here can be realized by the exponential family of the system, but it's achieved by the maximum entropy. So it's the maximum entropy distribution that actually goes in. So the Gaussian, for example, is the maximum entropy distribution that realizes kind of the particular set of mean parameters. Um, so the maximum entropy, maybe I'll talk about that later. But, um, uh, is this sort of what I'm trying to get at is clear? 
So this step is bigger than what is potentially realized by an exponential family. So if I have an exponential family with this sufficient statistic in the canonical form, uh, it would be something like this. I start from P of X. And then there's not a sort of family, but it's not a associated with it as a very take that and take that card class set. What I'm claiming is that that set is exactly up to the boundary. The same as all possible means that can be realized by any density. Yeah. That's the result. Yeah. Did that make sense? Yes. Uh, we are not defining sufficiency. We are, this this mean term this makes there is no sufficiency here. So I just define this math T of X. So T of X is just in like a nonlinear math maps. So they're very long to the bunch of things, right? X is where sign and for the numbers. And then if I put a distribution of X, this takes some value. If I put a different distribution, if it's a different density, it takes another value. And then varying this density for all possible densities, this takes a bunch of values. The set of all possible values in this set of realizable means, and everything in there can be achieved by the exponential family. We cannot have the exponential family that has this sufficient. Okay, so ignore this part a little bit. Um, so this is the result. Uh, the function is this. So uh, anything in the interior of every realized by the exponential family. So that's the domain. Yes, before the four exponential family, assuming S A is a specific of truth, then the gradient of A, uh, mass inferior of A, the inferior form of the inferior of M in a one to one amount of Okay. So that gradient of that mass inferior form of the into the for K because this is all possible realizing means. The green of a theta is a particular realizable means of mapping into this. Um, the fact that it doesn't map the boundary is also okay. So, but the fact that it's on to this is pretty not fine. So, it maps it and can like, cover the green thing. And so, if that's the case, then I can invert it. So, there is an inverse. So, it's like one to one and into and then an inverse. It. So if, if anything is in the interior of the room, it's because you want to know it's like a bijection. So there is a bijective map from the interior of omega to the interior of M. One way is gradient of A, and the other is the uh, gradient of the inverse. I'd say the inverse of the gradient. Okay, that's the essentially like the, the, the result that I, I was trying to get at. Um, Okay, so uh, so the interior is again. Uh, if you look at the set of realizable means, uh, so the set of all possible realizable moments, but any distribution is this distribution. But the ones that are uh, achievable by densities, this 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 um, then there is some quality in the problems. Okay. So it means that the second moment is equal to the first moment. So it mean, means that the variance is zero. If the variance is zero, the random variable is constant. Uh, it can't have density to take the load measure. So, uh, like let's say, if you knew it's a load measure, and if you define it like this, uh, then this set is going to be open. It's not going to have to bound. So you don't have to worry too much about the boundary. But the boundary is achieved by, by as limits, so limits of things that are either here or in the case of exponential boundary, the exponential boundary, uh, the limit is the boundary. 